Hi, welcome and thanks for joining us today for our webinar. I am Allison Guimera. I am one of the UCLA pediatricians, and I am pleased to present to you today a webinar on children and social media, what every parent should know. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a general pediatrician at the UCLA Porter Ranch office. We are open for patients, so come in and see us. I want to remind you to ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or to comment on Facebook. So social media, it's everywhere. Um, it's broadcast media on TV. It's media on Facebook and Twitter where hopefully you're commenting on this, um, this webinar. It's interactive media like games. Um, and a recent study in 2015 showed that Children under four, 96% um, of them had used a media device, and 75% of them actually owned their own device. Two-year-olds, the majority of them use a media device every day. 75% of teenagers have their own smartphone, and a quarter of teenagers say that they're constantly connected. So it really is everywhere, and it's everywhere for us, and it's everywhere for our kids. And as a pediatrician and a parent myself, I find myself tumbling through these questions, um, thinking about how do I make sure media is safe for my kids? How much is too much media? When, when should my child have a cell phone? Um, how do I keep my children safe from internet predators? And the media landscape, it's changing constantly, day to day, um, year to year. And often the, the answers to these questions are changing. But hopefully I can, today I can give you a little um, insight into some of these questions and how to frame your mindset when you're thinking about media and your children. So social media, it's not all bad. Um, we're using media more and more um, in our schools, in our educational systems. Um, it helps our children be exposed to new ideas, to current events. Um, it helps them keep connected with their friends, their teachers, um, their loved ones, your family, relatives that don't live close to you. Um, and it helps them learn technical skills. There's so many kids out there that today that are learning um, they're learning programming and learning lots of different um, technology things from being on social media. Um, social media help also helps them learn character strengths like teamwork and curiosity and exploring that curiosity on web, web and um, on educational TV shows. So I first want to talk to you about media use and young children. Um, so I'm going to talk about children who are under the age of five. Um, so this is such an important and critical time for brain growth, for developing, for developing language skills, cognitive skills, behavioral skills. Um, and so when thinking about media use in young children, you really want to think about three C's. Um, and those three C's are the child, the context, and the content. And I'm going to give you a little bit um, of take home points on how to think about your child and their age and their developmental um, stage, the, the context by what, your, what kind of media your child is using, and, and the content, what, what is actually um, in that, what is educational, what isn't educational. So um, for children ages zero to five, you always want to remember that healthy habits start early, and this includes media habits. Um, you want to consider your child's developmental stage when you're introducing um, digital media, and you really, really want to balance um, digital media, whether that be a tablet or TV watching, with other hands-on educational play activities. Um, so for children ages two and younger, the benefits of social media is really limited. Um, they learn best by exploring the world around them and doing hands-on play. A child who's um, one year old, 15 months old, um, and younger kids, they have difficulty 
transferring what's on a screen into real life. They don't have the, the cognitive skills to transfer um, those ideas from the screen into real life, and thus they have uh, trouble learning really good skills from social media. So in this age, media should be really limited. Um, if you are doing some media for children age two and younger, I really recommend um, sitting with them and watching the media with them and co-viewing with them so, so that you as the parent can help them translate that material into real life and reteach them what they're seeing. Look, look, can you see the dog on the screen? Oh, that's a dog. Um, look at our dog. And so those kind of examples, um, talking to them, um, kind of helps them learn from media. Um, one really great thing for children under two is video chatting. So with um, extended family, with um, other parents, with siblings, um, video chatting can be great. Um, there is some evidence that children close to two years of age can learn new words and new ideas from chatting with another person on the screen. But in the end, you should, for two-year-olds, avoid solo media use. For children age two to five, um, they are able to learn some social, some language, and some reading skills from uh, social media, um, that being TV and apps on tablets. Um, and re my recommendations for this age group would be to limit the screen time to no more than one hour per day. Um, and to choose some really good content for them to, to be viewing or interacting with on tablets. Um, choose um, a context that's nonviolent and educational media. And I want parents to be aware of the app stores um, where you can go and click on educational apps. Not all that apps in the educational section are truly educational. Um, they're not all made by educators and they're, they're not all the same. Um, a lot of them rely on rote academic skills, memorization, repeating, um, and they're not really curricula based. Um, I'll give you some examples a little bit later of where you can find some good ideas for apps, but not all apps are created the same. And as with the younger kids, for kids at age two to five, um, really I encourage you to co-view and co-participate in media with your children. Um, this is the best way that they can learn and be engaged um, in social media. And you can also start monitoring their media use as they start to grow and become older and more independent. Um, I want to talk a little bit about media overuse in young ch children. Uh, this can be a problem with kids who are watching hours and hours of TV a day or with those kids who are stuck on their tablets. Um, the, the blue light emission from screens it themselves can lead to overstimulation in young kids and it can decrease the amount of melatonin that the brain releases. Um, melatonin is, is our body's natural stimulus for sleeping and so it can, can lead to less sleep and falling asleep later in younger children. And poor sleep, we know, can lead to behavior problems, problems in school. Um, so I really recommend um, to limit the, the media use in, in young children and also limit the amount of um, TV and tablets that they have um, accessible to them, particularly in their room, in their, in their bedrooms. Um, media overuse can also lead to delays in learning and social skills. Um, they can, um, they don't have as, bad, as good attention and critical thinking skills if they're just learning from those rote memorization um, and, and um, high-paced TV shows. Um, there can be behavior problems if children are viewing violent um, content on, on uh, the television um, or violent app contents. Children may try to mimic some of those on-screen behaviors because they may be um, seen, may see them as something that they should be doing. And then um, we want to talk about obesity when we talk about 
media overuse in young children. So um, children who viewed more than um, five hours a week of TV have an increased risk of for BMI. And we think this is because there's lots of food advertising that goes on on TV shows. Um, and a lot of kids are snacking during their TV use or during their tablet use. Um, and then, you know, the more time you spend using um, digital devices, the less time you're spending playing and being active. So all of this kind of leads to um, increased risk for obesity in children who overuse media. Um, so a couple suggestions on content for young kids. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics really um, recommends PBS and Sesame as great educational tools for um, young kids. They have um, TV programming, they have websites, and they have apps uh, for, for young children um, that are highly educational. Um, and um, you can do games and videos and interactive things. Um, and these are great suggestions for younger children, um, provided that you're co-viewing with them. And then I want to mention a little bit about Common Sense Media. This is a website that gives um, some age-appropriate media picks and it gives media ratings for parents, um, not just for younger ki kids, but for school-age kids and older children as well. Uh, they rate TV shows, they rate movies, they rate apps, um, and they give you suggestions. Hey, I want to watch a holiday movie with my two-year-old. Um, what can I watch? And you can go on to Common Sense Media and find great rated um, TV shows, um, movies for your kids of that specific age. There's also a, a lot of um, parent frequently asked questions on this page with some great answers if, if um, my webinar today doesn't answer all of your questions. So I also want to talk about media use in older children. So um, teenagers, um, a quarter of teenagers say that they're constantly connected. Um, and in 2012, they did a study on how many how often teenagers text, and on average, they found that they text about 100 times a day. So um, our teenagers out there are using social media. They are constantly connected to their, to their friends, um, to the internet, and um, parents really need to think about how um, to guide their, their teenagers into safe media use. So the benefits of social media for teens and preteens is great. Um, they use this, um, they use the internet, they use blogs, they use um, educational interfaces all the time for school, and they're constantly connected to their friends. So they're staying engaged with their friends, with their family through social media. And social media can be great for exchanging ideas, expanding their worldview, connecting with like-minded people who they may not know on the internet through blogs, through um, video chatting, through um, lots of different things. Um, there are also risks for older kids um, for media overuse. Um, there's the risk of obesity, which I talked about um, earlier. Um, there have been studies with older kids who watch um, lots of TV as well and they, they also have increased risk for um, higher weight and higher BMIs. And it has a similar negative effect on sleep for the older kids as well. Um, using a, a mobile device or watching TV before um, bed, particularly that hour before bed, um, really does decrease um, total sleep duration. It decreases um, the amount of sleep that you get and um, it makes it harder to fall asleep. Um, really overusing media can lead to academic performance declines. Um, and then I wanted to mention a little bit about internet gaming disorder. This is actually a psychologic disorder that 
um, about 8 to 10 percent of uh, teens and preteens um, may fit this diagnosis, which is a preoccupation with video games and a decreased interest in any offline lives. And usually um, with this internet gaming disorder, they are unsuccessful in stopping doing the gaming activity, um, their grades are declining, and they often have withdrawal symptoms including irritability um, and, and difficulty when they're are not um, participating in internet gaming. If you think your child may have um, this problem, I would strongly recommend that you talk to your pediatrician um, about this problem and um, look to your pediatrician to provide you with some resources in helping solving a problem like this. Uh, children who overuse media are also at risk for um, participating in risky internet behavior, which I'm about to talk about next. So, Teenagers in general have a limited capacity for self-regulation. They are just learning what it means to um, be independent, to be older, um, and um, they are susceptible very much to the influences of their peers. And this is not just limited to what they're wearing, what they're eating, what they're doing at school, but it's how they're participating on online behaviors. And so children who are more at risk offline, who participate in um, risky behaviors offline, are often um, more at risk online as well. Uh, they often visit sites that are not age appropriate. Um, they are exposed to media content that encourages more risky behaviors. Um, the alcohol companies have such a strong um, advertising presence on things like Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so earlier exposure to alcohol and drugs and sexual activity often leads to earlier initiation of those kinds of behaviors for teenagers. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some risky internet behaviors, including bullying, cyberbullying, cyber and sexting here. Um, so sexting is the electronic transmission of nude or semi-nude images or sexually explicit text messages. So about 10% of teenagers have sent a sexually explicit text, while um, about 30% of teenagers have received a sexually explicit text. And teens who pay for their own cell phone bill tend to uh, participate in sexting more frequently. Um, so sexting is definitely a topic that you want to uh, open the conversation up with your, your teen or preteen about. Um, talk to them that images that are sent um, can't be retrieved and they can easy, easily be resent by other people. So often a sexting occurs between um, people who are in a relationship, but they can also occur between um, groups of friends. They happen not just over a text message, but over private instant messaging on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, it happens on Snapchat. It happens on anonymous messengers like Kik. Um, Talk to your children about not resending images that are sent to them. Um, so this is often called revenge sexting. So they have a picture, they break up with a significant other, and then they start sending that explicit um, text or image to other people for revenge. Um, this is where they can really get in trouble. Um, talk to them about delete and don't repeat. Um, there is a website called that'snotcool.com. It is a website that is focused for teens and preteens, how to respond to friends, how to respond to sexually explicit text messages, what to do. Um, so if you, if you find yourself lacking the words to talk to your children, maybe direct them to um, that website. It, it may be very helpful and informative to them. I just want you guys all to know about laws. Every state has a law that protects minors against um, sexual exploitation. So if you are under 18 and you create, send, or receive sexually explicit images of another minor, um, it could be considered child pornography. Um, and the punishment can be um, misdemeanor or felony. Um, you may have to pay fines um, and you may have to be on a child um, child watch list. 
Um, so talk to your children that this isn't something that should be taken lightly. It's not something that's just fun between friends, um, but there are serious consequences to sexting. Uh, I also want to talk about cyberbullying and online harassment. Uh, teens are the highest risk for um, cyberbullying and online harassment. Um, the definition is uh, media communication to deliver false, intimidating, or embarrassing information about an individual. The most common uh, groups of people who um, experience cyberbullying are girls, those who are obese, those who have medical disabilities, and those who, who are LGBTQ. So uh, if your child is one of those, or even if your child isn't one of those, um, cyberbullying is something that you should bring up to them and discuss with them. It is, um, usually happens over instant messaging, email, and texting. Uh, there are a lot of anonymous um, instant messaging uh, applications that teenagers are on. Um, some of them are Kick or Yik Yak, um, where the, the bully is faceless and anonymous um, and easy to um, target people who are vulnerable. Um, just a few signs to look out to if your child is the bully. Um, often when they are um, using the computer in a room, they're switching screens often. Um, they may have multiple logins for the same social media site. And then signs that your child is being bullied. Uh, often kids are reluctant to discuss with their parents that they are being bullied. Um, bullies often uh, try to isolate those who they're bullying um, and talk to them, you know, if you tell anyone, I'll hurt you or um, I'll make your life miserable. So often kids don't want to report that or they don't want to get their friends in trouble. Um, but knowing the signs as a parent is something that's very important. So uh, your child may have school avoidance. They may be upset or tearful and not willing to talk to you about why after using their cell phone, their computer, or their tablet. Um, they may be in general more saddy, more sad or moody, um, or just more withdrawn than usual. And they may have um, declining school performance. So what do you do if your child is being bullied? I would say if your child tells you that they're being bullied, take those, that report very seriously. Um, and before you think your child might be bullying as they're getting into using social media more, talk to them about bullying. Um, tell them to talk to an adult if they're being bullied and to reach out to friends for support. About 15% of kids experience some form of bullying online and about 20% of kids experience bullying in person. So it's, it's out there. Um, there are plenty of kids that are experiencing this even right now who may not be willing to talk to their parents about it. Have your child save any evidence of bullying, whether that's emails, instant messengers, um, text messages, print them out, save them. Um, there's always two sides to the story, so if you know who the bully is and you know who the parents are, try and figure out what happened. Uh, sometimes children um, have miscommunications between them. Children make mistakes, and uh, so um, talk with the other parents to determine what may have gone on. Uh, schools deal with bullying all the time, so a school is a great resource for parents if you think your child's being bullied by someone at school. And then I encourage you to talk to the police if uh, there's serious bullying going on, if there's a serious danger to your child, if there were physical threats um, made to your child, this is the time to get the police involved. Um, as a parent, you may feel like your child knows so much more about media than you do. And you're probably right. Uh, they are constantly connected. Maybe you are too, but you just don't understand what apps they're using, what websites they're using. But I, I really encourage you to try to bridge that um, digital gap. Uh, children are so savvy. 
Um, and so they are such a great resource for parents. Have them teach you what they are using, what different apps they're using. Make it a rule for your family that whatever social media sites they're on, you're on them too and you have to be their friends. Uh, you can also kind of limit the application downloading. So you have to have all application downloading go through you so you know what um, apps your children are using, what sites your children are viewing. Um, but keeping, keeping the conversation open with your children, knowing what they're using, when they're using, um, is very important. Asking your children open-ended questions uh, is very important. So, what did you do on the internet today? Did anyone text you? What did you post on Facebook today? Are great questions to open the conversation with your children. And other parents are a great resource as well. Maybe they've found out some other websites and apps that, that um, you didn't know your kids were using. So talking to other parents about their children's media use is important too. Um, one of the best recommendations I provide to parents in my clinic um, and I can provide to you today is to think about making a family media use plan. And this is kind of a contract between you and your children about what your family expectations for media use is. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has a interactive tool that will help you uh, make a media use plan. So it talks about screen-free zones. So um, when you're in the car, you're not allowed to use screens. Or when we're eating dinner together, you're not allowed to have your um, tablet or phone at the table. It talks about device curfews. So um, phones should be charged in the parents' room overnight. You're not allowed to use your phone overnight um, in your own room. And it talks, uh, they have sections about media manners and digital citizenship and um, sleep and exercise. So in order to maintain your media privileges, you need to continue to get eight hours of sleep a night. You need to continue to participate in your extracurricular activities and do well in school. Uh, this is a little screenshot from one of um, from the uh, family media use plan provided by the AAP. You can select um, different things that are applicable to your family. They have uh, different age ranges, so you can choose an age range that's appropriate for your children. Um, but for example, this one talks about screen-free zones, um, keeping the kitchen or dining room table and meal times um, technolo technology free, um, which is a great suggestion for any family. This one talks about device curfews, where the devices will charge overnight, whether that's in the parents' bedroom, in the kitchen, or uh, some other designated uh, place in your house. So discussing um, with your children, no matter what age they are, about being um, good digital citizens is really important. And then also discussing about the consequences of poor judgment. Um, that they can be punished for sexting and bullying and being online is never completely anonymous. Talk about how your family won't tolerate them gossiping or bullying or rumoring on the internet about other people. Um, discuss a digital footprint. So whatever they post on the internet is going to be there tomorrow. It's going to be there in five years when they're going to college. It's going to be there in 15 years when they're applying for a new job or raising their own family. So opening the conversation with your family, uh, with your children, um, is so important to, aspect to being a good digital citizen. I just want to mention a quick bit about um, parents' digital media use, so sharing photos of your own children online. 92% of two-year-olds have their own online presence, um, so consider how your own social media use may affect your children's well-being both today and in the future. Um, will they want to see a picture of them at two screaming and crying and throwing a tantrum when they're 18 and trying to apply to college? Um, so for parents, um, 
responsibly and thoughtfully share about your children. Um, if you are thinking about sharing about some struggles that your ch child has, whether that be emotional or behavioral or health struggles, consider posting anonymously or consider only sharing with your closest friends. Um, Again, you are making a digital footprint for your children, so um, limiting things that they wouldn't want on the internet. In a similar vein, older kids should be, decide, should be able to decide what you post about them. Um, this includes pictures or stories or things like that. I um, recommend that you become familiar with the privacy settings on the websites and uh, media sites that you are on, um, limiting your privacy, um, but also remembering that private, privacy settings aren't foolproof and really um, anyone can um, view and repost and resend um, things that you put on the internet and it does have the chance that it could end up in the hands of people who you don't want it to end up in. And uh, a lot of websites have um, location services, so be sure that you're never sharing your child's location, whether that be the name of their school or where you're vacationing or things like that. Um, it's really important not to share your child's location uh, because that can end up in the hands of child predators. So some take home points is um, communicate um, early and often about your about online use with your kids. Um, it's never too early to start the conversation. Discuss issues like cyberbullying, sexting, and time management. Um, bridge that participation gap. So really get in there. Um, try to learn what your child is uh, doing on the internet, what sites they're on, why they're, why they're using certain social media, um, and have them teach you. Um, develop a family, family online use plan. Uh, the AAP has a great resource for that um, with an em emphasis on them being good digital citizens and having healthy behaviors outside of their media use. Supervise online activities for younger kids. Um, by participating with them. Uh, internet monitoring tools and software is great, but it's not foolproof. Um, so I recommend, I recommend that parents be actively involved with their children's media use. Um, encourage them to balance their online and offline lives. Um, it's not all about their online lives, but it's not all about their offline lives too. We need in this day and age to learn how to um, appropriately mold both of those. And then model responsible media use um, yourself. So don't always be connected yourself. You know, take time during dinner to sit down. Uh, look up from your phones, put your phones away, talk to each other, play with each other, um, do fun activities that aren't involving media. So thank you so much for listening to this webinar on children and social media use. Uh, I understand we have a few questions from Twitter, um, so I'm going to grab those questions. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can um, post them as well. So the first question is, my teen constantly texts, what can I do? And this is such a great question and so relevant. Um, teens are always texting with their friends and uh, the first thing to do is to remember that this is a normal part of teenage lives. This is how they stay connected with their friends outside of school. And so, um, you should probably decide whether your teen's texting is problematic or not. It's problematic if it's interfering with their school life, if it's interfering with your family life. Again, I talked about making a family media use plan, so no texting at the dinner table, no texting after you go to bed, things like that are important guidelines to put in place for your family. Um, also, um, modeling good media behavior yourself. So, you know, if you're constantly texting, you can't um, then turn around and tell your child that they're constantly texting too. So, uh, some things you can do as a parent is um, narrate your own media use. So, I'm texting dad to let him know that we'll be late to the event. Um, and so your, your children know who you're texting and why you're texting um, and um, 
that's a great way to model uh, good media use. The second question is, how do I turn off the TV without creating a meltdown? And I think this is probably directed towards younger children um, who love watching their favorite TV show. Uh, this is a question I get all the time in my clinic. Um, you know, my kids love Peppa Pig and they won't turn it off. Um, so what can I do? So um, again, with your younger children, setting expectations is key. So saying, we're going to watch TV for 30 minutes. That means one episode of SpongeBob, and then we're going to be done. Um, so they know that they're, what, when things are starting and when things are ending. And then giving a warning when, when things are getting close to being done. So, um, you know, five more minutes and then we are going to, and, and insert what they're gonna do next. Then we're gonna have dinner or then we're gonna take a bath so they know what's coming next. Um, and then I would encourage you to try and use your DVR a little bit more. Often with TV, one program bleeds into the next one or on Netflix, one um, show automatically prompts another one to start playing. And that can often be hard to turn off the TV once a new show has started. So if you're using uh, the DVR function, the show will end um, and it won't start playing the next one in line. So that can often be helpful for parents. The last question is, uh, what age should my child have a cell phone? And this is uh, a very um, personal decision for a lot of families. Um, typically, children start asking when they're preteens, uh, late elementary school, early, um, early middle school is when children are asking their parents for a cell phone. And so you really need to decide why your child um, is using or would need to use a cell phone. A lot of parents feel comfortable that their, their child has a way to get in contact with them. But if they're at school or after school activities, often there is a parent there who has a cell phone and the need for cell phones really isn't um, necessary. Um, I would say in general, uh, middle school age, children are responsible enough to take care of a cell phone. Any younger than that, um, there may be issues with forgetting, um, losing, or breaking a cell phone, although um, I'm sure many of your teens um, and uh, other family members have broken a cell phone or two in their life. Um, and then thinking about, um, is there any special circumstances for why my child might need a cell phone? Um, do both parents work and it's difficult to get a hold of parents and a cell phone might be beneficial? Or does my child have a special medical problem that, um, you know, I need to be alerted immediately if they have an emergency. Those might be situations where uh, you may consider giving your child a cell phone a little bit earlier. So um, thank you so much for these great questions and for listening to today's webinar. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with you guys about social media and children. Um, thanks for joining us.